Helmira was originally Tadmor or Tadmer, which means city of dates. It became Palmyra, city of palms, but now it's once more called Tadmor when they when they moved the city to a, a different location. The fertility symbol, I'm reading from the book here, uh, uh, In Search of the Birth of Jesus, which is actually now titled Journey of the Magi. <clears throat> <laughs> the fertility symbolism of palms and dates permeates not just man Mandean scriptures, but as we've seen, uh, the uh, the Mandeans. Oh, I have to try to remember this. I re I've read this, you know, a few months ago. It, it comes back to me slowly here. Uh, the Nazarenes were like the, kind of like the priests of the Man Mandeans. And they they were the only ones that got to read the scriptures. Were the Nazarenes? The Mandeans they were the ones who thought that Jesus was a failed Messiah. Uh, they, they didn't call him a false Messiah. They just said he failed. So there, I remembered it. That's, that's what I was trying to remember. So let me go back here. The fertility symbolism of palms and dates permeates not just Mandaean scriptures, but as we've seen, the Holy Quran and much Sufi literature. Like Babylon, Palmyra was a city that empowered its rulers, which is why the Romans destroyed it. As they destroyed Jerusalem a century earlier. But unlike Babylon, Palmyra was more feminine, feminine in nature, not quintessentially hostile and militaristic. Its rulers had something else to confer power on them, it would seem. And that something was a trade in ideas that complemented the trade in things, but brought far greater profits. At Dura Europis, a few hours drive away these days, the Romans were learning what the Palmyrenes already knew, that ideologies, not armies, were the real weapons of what would become the... Christian or common error, or common error, as I've heard the initials explained by anti-Christians. So in this chapter called the Museum of Syria, uh, the part I was just reading, if you go back uh, to the previous page or whatever, or maybe a couple pages back, it's titled The Mistress of the Ox. Afka Springs. So this is maybe where it fits together with the uh, Mohammed poem of the uh, day tree. Palmyra generally, in fact, contained too much for me to take in. There was even a medicinal spring called Af Afka, which according to undisputed evidence, was used for thermal hydrotherapy as far back as Neolithic times. Just like the Sayak, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, civilization at Ka Kashan with Solomon's fountain and his altar up in the nearby Zagros foothills. Not far from the Neolithic votive altars and tunnels discovered near the Afka Spring, is a relatively recent inscription dated October A.D. 162, the year a 5,000-seater Roman theater dedicated to Zeus was erected near the Acropolis in Athens, and the year the construction of the first Christian church in Britain began in Glastonbury. In Latin it reads, To Zeus the highest, the master of the world, by Boldua, son of Zebedah, 
or Zebida, at the time when he was surveyor of the Afka Springs. I'll just keep continuing reading here. It's it's it seems interesting to me. I don't know. It might be boring you, but it's it seems pretty good to me. Water has always been important to the master of the world to destroy his fiefdom and inhabitants in order to save them. To have his heroes born from or just to immerse mere mortals in symbolically before granting them immortality. Three quarters of a century after Boldua's inscription, Zenobia, queen of Palmyra, was mistress of the springs. More beautiful than any writer dares describe, she was also deemed more dangerous than Rome needed to tolerate. Some claim she announced herself a descendant of Cleopatra. Others use the term reincarnation. Either way, in the 2nd century AD, the last thing Rome needed was the second coming of Cleopatra, who was herself Isis, reborn. The empire used as its excuse for taking offense that Zenobia had minted her own coin. She'd done this in Alexandria at a time when it was probably the most civilized place on earth, and when Christianity still had promise being blended with Jewish and Egyptian mysticism and Greek philosophy into what could have been a sane, exquisite Neoplatonist faith. But Zenobia's coin, like the fructifying ideas of Alexandria's Hellenized Jewish Christians, was a blatant affront to the divine rulers of Rome, the August Caesars, who wanted what was theirs rendered onto them. A massive army was dispatched, and before long the brave and beautiful Zenobia found herself the centerpiece of Aurelian's triumph. She was led in true Roman tradition like a beast through the eternal city for all to see what became of those who challenged the empire. On the route to her Palmyrene palace, I noticed, were four pillars of Aswan granite, supposedly gifts from the Egyptian pharaoh to Zenobia. There was no real pharaoh in Egypt in the second century AD, though, merely Ptolemaic Quislings, who had lost control of Upper Egypt or Nubia, where Aswan is situated. Yet this was unmistakably the finest pink Aswan granite like that used for inner chambers in the Great Pyramid, and that later reserved for special obelisks and sarcophagi. How such mighty columns of solid granite were shipped here from Egypt at all is one question. Who shipped them, when and why, is another. Such fine stones could easily have been adapted from an earlier structure to promote the living myth of Zenobia. We may never know, since an earthquake ravaged the site, confounding any attempt to chart the original positions of fallen stones. But yet again, Egypt's presence here was powerfully evident. By A.D. 270, Zenobia had taken control of Syria entirely, conquered Lower Egypt, and had armies proceeding across Asia Minor as far as the Bosphorus. The granite pillars could have been booty, but it's unlikely in the time frame available. By 274, a mere four years later, she was dead, a prisoner in a gilded Roman cage, and Palmyra had been crushed into submission. Its status was never regained. It hasn't really been examined properly either, either, particularly within the context of its relationship with the religion of the East and the religions that develop more locally. Anyone just comparing a ground plan of the Baal Temple to that of Solomon's extrapolated from the Bible would have to admit that there's far more to Palmyra than historians have so far conceded. But Syria, like so many places, has been cut off from the West for much of the century because of Cold War politics and has just opened its doors again. 
Besides Egypt, nowhere in the Middle East is so rich in the remains of those civilizations upon which our own has been built. Palmyra will undoubtedly yield up its secrets over the next century as the history books are once more revised, along with the preconceptions and prejudices that eternally fill them with er errors. So there I've caught up to the part I, I first read, so I'll stop there, but... Uh, Unfortunately, this, this last part that I read here, uh, a lot of this stuff has been destroyed now because of the Civil War. So maybe we won't get to uh, find out more about it, uh, which is unfortunate, but, you know, that's the way things happen sometimes. We probably have enough knowledge already to, to figure th things out. Okay, we'll stop there again. Thanks.